Today, I am going to be going through eight different industries to talk about some use cases as to why you might want to use a knowledge graph. So if you missed the first video over there, that is talking about why you might want a knowledge graph in a general sense, what you might want to think about before getting into a project. Now we're going to talk about use cases. So let's go get started. Here's a recap on just the differences between a traditional relational database and a graph database. Now, the nice thing is once you have a graph database, not only is it going to help you with those super queries, but it also makes your data more intelligent. Okay, so we're going to start off with education. So there is so much data out there on faculty and students and publications and courses and Blackboard and all kinds of metrics that are associated with education, learning metrics, publication metrics, a lot of those go into education. So here are just nine examples of the internet of things. So what do you do with all that massive amounts of data that a university or any other kind of school, this could be a K through 12, it could be um, any kind of vocational school, education in general. I won't go through all of these, I'm going to link all of these things in the description below. But you can see here are some examples of how the knowledge graph, the, the internet of things in this case, um, things that are connecting other things are being used in an educational setting. All of this is focused on impact. What is the impact of the courses that you offer? What is the impact of your publication and your research? What is the impact of the entire department's um, research output on the rest of the world? What is the impact of your specific teaching methods and the different assignments that you do? And how that connects to all of the other education and coursework that your students might be using. You do have to be careful, again, with privacy and make sure that you're anonymizing everything, especially when you're dealing with anyone under the age of 18 or groups that um, you need to treat more ethically, I should say. Um, and those would include, you know, prisoners, um, people with any kind of um, disability, those sorts of things. So make sure you do your research before you start using data in this space. Okay, next up is medical. This one is huge. Medical was one of the first industries to really put knowledge graph through its paces. In fact, most ontologies um, in the very beginning <laughs> were on the medical side. So here I am just using one use case and that is drug interactions. So if you are in the medical space and you need to be able to track all of the different drugs and all of the different reactions to help you narrow down the symptoms that you are seeing in a patient and based on whatever they are taking their medication, there are ontologies to help with that. So this is just the ontology. This is actually free. BioPortal is free. So you can go in and check this out on your own and you can download it and you can use it if you would like to test out what this looks like. So let's go look at a little bit of research on this topic. Here, again, this is all of the articles I'm going over in this video are open and free. I will put those in the description below. Here, you're looking at the drug to drug interaction prediction base. And this is all on knowledge graph embeddings and convolutional LSTM networks. So I'm not gonna go into what all of those mean. There's a whole article, as you can see on that topic, but this is showing that the medical space, it's not just one ontology that I showed you. You can go onto BioPortal and find a million different types that meet a lot of different medical needs, some of which are tracking diseases, like we're seeing today. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can do with, with the um, medical and even supply chain, right? So bringing some of these industries together. What is the supply chain like for different vaccines? Or what is the supply chain look like and the, the demand that you can supply on any kind of drug um, that is needed in certain areas of the world? Or based on what kind of roadway systems or different types of transportation? Some areas of the world, they cannot get medicine unless it is flown in by a helicopter. All of these things, yes, it's, it's transportation, yes, it's supply chain, and it is medical. So all of these things, you can use a knowledge graph to help you understand how these very intricate 
connections come together so you can make smart decisions. Moving on, you can also, and these are often used in the government. So here you're going to see, this is the UK um, Gov website. They have a really cool model. You can go in and check this one out. But this one is also talking about more um, where the centralized things are and when they need to be distributed. So again, it's sort of like supply chain. Um, you can also use this in understanding if there is issues in a welfare system, right? So you can sort of use it almost like the insurance companies use it to kind of understand where the fraud might be. Um, there are other things that tie into this, like if there is a universal healthcare system, um, so that's tying in health and the government knowledge graphs, all of these things can play together. The theme that we're seeing here is if you have a lot of disparate data or you are dealing with pockets of heterogeneous data, it's really a helpful tool to start to look at modeling these as a graph. A lot of these different use cases already have ontologies associated with them. I'm not going into all of the ontologies that are backing all of this in this video, but I am certainly going to talk about it in future videos. So if you look at this one, this one is looking at how the administration is actually set up. So here, I've skipped down, this one is also looking at the, the revenue and the different financial pieces of government. You can use these for taxes and making sure that you understand, I guess taxes, they're core, as much as we all don't like them. Um, they are used for public services like roadways and waterways and bridges and you know a number of things like that. You wouldn't necessarily want to allocate a lot of tax money um, to a region in a desert region for bridges, unless they have a lot of gullies or something, but chances are they don't have a lot of waterways there. So you can see that understanding the allocation of things or being able to almost sit in the middle of these and be was like a I hate to put it this way, but it's almost like sitting in the middle of a spider web and when something, you know, catches on the web somewhere, you can kind of feel where it is and you can figure out where you want to go. Speaking of which, cybersecurity. This is also talking about not just fraud, which is more on the insurance side, but also how do you identify threats? So I have worked in this space before. Knowledge graphs are incredibly useful when it comes to identifying threats or understanding the probability of threats. So here you can see there is an ontology for cybersecurity. Here you're talking about a graph-based visual way of looking at a threat and looking at threat intelligence. So the intelligence, the intelligence communities do use knowledge graphs. They do use um, indications. Remember, understanding what are the rules and the triggers that we all understand as humans and programming that into a system so that when data comes in, it can pick up on those types of rules. It's no different with threats. So right now this is talking about cyber threats, but what about threats of floods? So maybe you know that the age of a bridge is very old, so there is a likelihood that it could collapse. That's a really good thing for people to understand and, and know and make sure that resources are allocated to those things so they can be corrected. Same with cybersecurity. If there are threats that are um, triggered or, or suspected, then you know action can be taken to figure out, is it a false positive, making sure that things are, are actually accurate or making sure that if there is something bad going on, if there's a bad actor involved, that something can be done. All right, so moving on, we are now going to be looking at the transportation industry and general supply chain. Supply chain doesn't always have to mean transportation, but transportation is a big part of it. So they often go hand in hand. So flight analyzer, so this is New York 4J. This is a property graph. This is a very popular one. And you can see how the destination, the flight, the organization, and the ticket that is being assigned is something that a knowledge graph can help with. How do you understand even when is the most popular time? When is the most demand for flights? Probably around Christmas and Thanksgiving, or at least the holidays, I should say. Um, 
those are very common areas, but maybe it's also peak times are on um, Thursday afternoons and Monday mornings because there's a lot of business travel, at least there was. So these are things that knowledge graphs can help with. It's, it's looking at the broader picture and trying to help organize and understand what is being seen. Here, this is talking about urban data analysis. So this is talking about, you know, if you have a city that has a lot of traffic congestion, Boston, Boston, anyone? Um, that's where I'm from. This is a way to start to help plan for improvements to that urbanization, um, to make sure that if you are putting in new roads or new infrastructure, so sewers and electrical lines and, and all of that sort of thing, if you're trying to put in a solar farm, making sure that you can then connect that solar farm to any infrastructure that is going to need it, think Sim City. If you are a gamer, this is essentially what you're talking about, is making sure that all of that planning is coming together. So the theme here that we've been talking about is distributed networks, right? Things that have very big networks all on their own and only taking out the pieces of information that you need from each of those systems or each of those analytics, because it doesn't always have to be a system. It doesn't even have to be a knowledge graph on the other side. This could just be bringing in a lot of different databases from all over the place. Um, Internet of Things that we talked about earlier, that is a really prime example where I have been in a lot of those conversations on how to get the Internet of Things out um, at a broader scale. And a big part of it is trying to get all of these very dispersed, getting transportation figured out, getting the electrical grid figured out. One that a lot of people don't realize is electric cars. Well, if everybody is traveling from the suburbs into the city and a lot of people now have electric cars, guess what? They will have to charge that car when they get to work. And they will also have to charge it when they get home. Well, if everybody is going into the city at once, or a majority of people are, and all the people are coming back out of the city at a very similar time, you need to be able to make sure that the power grid has enough juice, so to speak, in both areas, depending on the demand. You know how that works? Knowledge graphs. Another one that is popular is um, Waze, which is a Waze navigation. It basically picks up on, again, those dispersed systems where um, there's Google Maps and, you know, the iPhone has its its own stuff. You know, there's, there's Garmin, there's TomTom, Tom, all of those things. There's a few other things that are also involved in this, like um, local municipalities or um, the local metros. All of that data is being assembled so that when you are on your app, Waze can tell you if you are in for a long haul and how to get around it. Okay, so let's go into the entertainment space. Because, by the way, this is a big occasion. Um, every 100 subscribers um, that the channel gets, again, I make no money off of this channel. It's really to um, get it out there, get the word out, and a big thank you to those that have subscribed and watch. Um, if you have subscribed and you can guess what show this still is from, put it in the comments below and you will win a, a Starbucks gift card for $15. I'm looking at all of the information about the people in this episode. And I have grayed out what it is so you can guess what this is in the comments. So you can see that the entertainment industry, I chose this one specifically because this is Amazon Prime. Amazon owns IMBD, which is a really wonderful resource to go and find people and what those people have done and basically all of their resume. All of that behind the scenes has unique IDs and knowledge graph-like capabilities. So here is an example that we've got John Grzynski, we've got Wendell Pierce. Now, the interesting thing is because Amazon Prime also has usage data, it knows that me and my ID have 
really a big interest in this show and maybe other shows like it or maybe other shows with John Krasinski in it. They will know that because of my behaviors. So the entertainment industry uses a lot of knowledge graph data to understand how to recommend shows, look at your behaviors and understand trends. Um, Netflix, for instance, they have a lot of their own shows and their own uh, movies. They have to understand what's going to, to sell, what is going to be interesting for people to watch. They have to look at trends to understand that kind of information. And the weather. So I alluded to this before, but the weather is used in a lot of different industries because it obviously affects a lot of things. Um, so this is just the weather channel and we're looking at the 10 day weather forecast. So how would you go about understanding all of the different data that you get in for the weather? Well, first of all, people have been crunching those numbers for a very long time, not always using knowledge graphs, but now that we have knowledge graphs, first you can connect it to all of the virus stuff that's going on today. Um, as, as the Weather Channel has done. It can also tell you based on you know past years, just like the Farmer's Almanac that was not a knowledge graph, but very intelligent. I wonder if somebody's turned the Farmer's Almanac into a knowledge graph. That's a cool idea. Hope somebody does that. So, and if you know if it exists, let me know. So weather is very, very common to find as a data source in knowledge graphs and in other intelligent systems that knowledge graphs can be a part of. So if you are somebody that has a clothing, uh, an online clothing store, and you want to send out recommendations, this is on the marketing side, um, and you want to make sure that, you know, there's, there's a big storm front coming into the location of your individual shop, and you want to make sure that all of your Valued customers know that it's going to be raining and you have a sale on umbrellas. That's how you might want to use uh, the weather. There's a ton of other reasons. You know, when we were talking about airlines, of course, if there's uh, storm fronts coming through, they have to think about how their their supplies and their their flights are going to be canceled. What happens when something breaks down? That's something else that knowledge graphs are really great at doing talked about recommendations in the entertainment business. Now we're talking about things like risk assessment and being able to handle when something actually happened. I already alluded to the insurance and financial industries using knowledge graphs. They go bananas over knowledge graphs. In fact, there's a whole ontology dedicated to finance. And so this is, again, looking at threat analysis, probabilities, being able to assemble a lot of different information, um, on individuals as well as individual groups to understand, you know, is this uh, person going to be a good investment for insurance or how would somebody go about approving a loan can benefit from a knowledge graph because it is helping you synthesize all of that into the rules that you have established as a business, as an industry to say, okay, this is an acceptable threshold based on all of this data that I have. I'm making those smart connections going back to the very beginning. Why can't I just use a table for these things? You can, it's gonna take you a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of money. And if you wanna do inferencing based on all of these rules from all of these different industries, if you wanna put it into smart systems like recommendation systems, this is the way to do it. Now, I don't suggest that Knowledge Graph is the solution to all problems. That's not true, but this is a really good place to start. What is your use case? And go from there, see if it's right for you. Okay, so that was a bit of a whirlwind and I am going to uh, continue to do more use case studies just like this. So with that, I hope this video has encouraged you to go out and look at use cases from your industry or an industry that you wanna get involved in. There are so many ways that you can use a knowledge graph and you don't have to start big. You can start small and get something really useful and meaningful out of it. All right, and with that, I wanna thank you very much. I'll catch you next time.